So, hello everybody. I think it's about time to start. Uh, I think we, we have more than 20 participants in the, in the session now. So welcome everybody. This is the, the session about metadata interoperability, shock and beyond. And uh, uh, my name is Marie Klemola, and some of you probably saw me already in the joint session just a few minutes ago. Uh, so I'm uh, uh, here representing the SOC uh, project, and I'm come from Tampere University uh, and the Finnish Social Science Data Archive, and uh, I'm also uh, part of SESTA, Eric. So today's uh, there are some housekeeping issues, issues. So the session will be recorded and this will be made available afterwards. Um, and, and please stay muted and keep your video off during presentations. And you can ask your questions in the chat throughout the session. So in this session today, we will discuss aspects of metadata interoperability uh, from both the SOC viewpoint and the EOSC hub viewpoint. Uh, and I, I think we will be discussing a lot about how standards meet reality. Uh, so we are doing some uh, catalogs, for example, and uh, uh, services for researchers. Uh, and, and all those, I think, are based on good metadata. Uh, but what is good metadata that uh, depends on the use case. In, so we are going to talk a little bit about the use cases as well. Uh, I will be talking about the shock viewpoint uh, and my presentation will include uh, things like shock metadata format diversity, uh, something about the use cases or our recommendations we are making in shock. Uh, and, and also I will be presenting uh, the forthcoming conversion hub. Claudia will talk about uh, uh, the EOSC hub uh, from the EOSC hub viewpoint, and she will focus on, on enhanced discoverability across research areas. And uh, she will also show concrete results uh, from integration activities. And she will also address some further developments. So this is the basic structure. We will both have, uh, I think, about 20 minutes for our talks. Uh, and then we, we can have questions uh, after the talks. And also, of course, during the talk using the chat. OK, I, I think. Uh, we are ready to start, uh, and I will go first, and then Claudia, it's your turn. So it's a little bit odd to be chairing as well as presenting, but this is how it works now. So I will change uh, to a different PowerPoint slide set, uh, hopefully in just a minute. So can you see my yes. Yes. other presentation? Great, thank you. So uh, shock metadata interoperability aspects, that's the title of my presentation today. And this is, uh, I'm not going to uh, make a claim that I will touch upon all and everything uh, about metadata uh, or interoperability. Uh, this will be a sort of narrow view, and I will get, uh, I will explain that in more detail later. Uh, there's a standard slide of SOC here, so but I'm sure you are all pretty familiar with the project, so I'm not going to go into any details. The interoperability work that I'm leading in SOC Task 3.5, it's part of Work Package 3. That's uh, all about tools and lifting uh, services into the cloud. Uh, and I, I will base a lot of uh, a lot of the things I'm going to say today on our uh, 
a deliverable that came out already more than a year ago, uh, SOC deliverable 3.1, uh, which was a report on um, metadata interoperability problems. So, I mean, we, we were not too optimistic when we wrote the, the description of uh, the project and we surmised that there will be problems uh, and challenges uh, uh, in, in the field of interoperability. So we did, uh, uh, we interviewed experts from all the SOC domains, so, so basic domains and uh, uh, based on those interviews, uh, we did this landscaping uh, piece. So, and, and when I'm talking about metadata here, I use, uh, I use the term to describe things that are described data and that give meaning to research data. But of course, we do know that um, the, the line between metadata and data uh, is not always clear. So what is metadata for somebody is probably data for somebody else. But this sort of uh, distinction between metadata and data seems to be uh, sort of de facto distinction within social sciences and humanities, uh, at least uh, for most cases. So what we learned uh, in our interviews uh, and what we have reported is that shock metadata landscape is uh, very heterogeneous and that that was no surprise to anyone. We already knew that this is this is what we will have. Uh, it was However, somewhat surprising uh, than a total of 19 metadata standards were explicitly mentioned as being used. Uh, and then when we asked for the most important metadata standards, we got uh, 11 different standards. So that's a, quite a lot, uh, quite a many standards. And then there are of course uh, uh, infrastructures that are not so very well developed yet. They might even not have recommendations or, or standard practices yet. So it's a quite a lot of standards. I know there are huge number of metadata standards in the world, uh, but even this 11, 19, 20, yeah, even that's, uh, I think a lot, and it's a challenge from the interoperability aspect uh, viewpoint. So then what we, uh, we wanted to make recommendations for the social science humanities infrastructures or the research, uh, researchers and so on about standards which to use. And we, we were thinking of use cases. So there's uh, clearly need for domain or community or discipline specific use uh, uh, of data and metadata. So, so there you need very expressive metadata standards uh, with very high level of detail. And in many cases also something that's tailored to local needs. Uh, so for example, uh, I come from the social sciences. So basically what we want to have described is uh, for example, variables uh, in a data set. And we want to describe not only the variables, but also the questionnaire that was used uh, to, to get into those variables and the relationships between variables and, and so on. So it's a never ending story, basically. And this high level of detail is, is really needed when you are doing this, uh, your research. So this is, if we are thinking about fair terms, then this is uh, very much about the reusability uh, of the data or usability, not even reusability, just uh, usability of the data. And this was a very clear use case uh, for, for the SOC uh, domains. Uh, and then, then another use case is, and not surprisingly either, is the discovery. So uh, researchers want to discover data across systems, and that's the findability and also the interoperability in FAIR. And there you need uh, clear and as simple as possible metadata and you will have high level of granularity. So when we are talking about data in social sciences, we, we call this study level or collection level. Uh, so it's, it's not about the files or it's not about the variables, it's, it's on a higher level. 
so you can find a study and, 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 and that's that. Uh, and I, I think uh, the one thing that we uh, we also thought that might happen and, and this was uh, what we found out from the interviews was also that there seems to be no middle ground. There's really no use case for anything that's somewhere in between. So it's uh, either this very uh, high level of granularity or it's, uh, this very expressive metadata. But it seems that there's no need to uh, put resources into, into something that's very much in the middle that would have something more than the very high level, uh, but not enough. So, so basically, the SOC recommendation is, is to use both. Uh, when you are, for example, uh, at least when we are talking about research infrastructures uh, in the SOC domain, so you will need to use the domain specific standards. And then you will need to uh, use some common standards to get your data out, to get the information about your data out. Uh, in an optimal case, of course, you can use your domain specific standard and that's compatible with some common standards. So you don't have to do things twice. You can just uh, uh, pick and choose the metadata elements you need and uh, use it uh, sort of expose that to the outer world or, or for the data catalogs, for example. So I want to show you what we recommended, uh, what are the recommendations we have made. Uh, so, so for this uh, high level granularity, we are recommending using Dublin Core. And we do know there are some uh, pros and cons there. Uh, and, and something we are calling now relaxed data site because we, we uh, many of the repositories, many in the domains, we're already using data site, uh, but then some are not. Uh, and, and the basic reason was that the data site requires uh, a DOI as the persistent identifier. So we sort of think that going a little bit the open air way where, where they accept other DO, uh, PIDs, uh, that would be the way to go. Then we have very specific uh, uh, standards for different domains, so very established ones like the DDI standards for social sciences. And I might uh, add that uh, there's the DDI CDI that is forthcoming. Uh, it did came, come up in our interviews, but uh, well, since this was more than a year ago, nobody was yet using it. But I, I think it's gaining momentum now. So from the heritage sciences side, there's the CIDOC CRM and the especially PEM. So that seems to be the de facto standards. Uh, Clarin clearly is using CMDI, which is a sort of group of standards. And uh, in, the, in the arts and humanities, basically DARIA, we have also CIDOC CRM and EDM and TEI were the ones uh, mentioned. And, and mostly used and uh, also recommended. Uh, in addition, we are making a recommendation that uh, when you are expressing vocabularies, you should use SCOS. And I think that was a sort of no brainer. Uh, although I might add that it turns out that several uh, uh, research organizations, researchers and infrastructures have vocabularies that are just plain text, a word document uh, typically. So there's work to do there. So the main main challenge is, uh, and I don't think you have any big news here either, but it's uh, basically that uh, organizations, and I know my organization has done this as well, uh, we tend to deviate from the standards. If the standard doesn't fit our use case, we just uh, yeah, misuse it or create a DR dialect of our own. Uh, especially if a standard is flexible, like DDI standards are, uh, then that's what happens. And uh, it's not great for the interoperability. So I, I, I think uh, in many cases, we need to combine forces. Uh, and instead of creating these local deviations, uh, we should work together uh, in this global Global uh, efforts, uh, for example, uh, under RDA or DDI Alliance or similar. 
Uh, we also know that mapping between standards is not straightforward. Probably some loss will happen. Uh, and then uh, sometimes that's okay, sometimes it's not. Uh, this requires a lot of work, uh, manual work, basically. Also in conversion, you will see lots of information. Uh, several of our interviews uh, reported on uh, non-compatibility with older versions of standards. So that's also a problem from interoperability viewpoint. And, and uh, yeah, I, I don't think the last one, the, the thing that uh, the boundary of data and metadata can be unclear, it's not really a problem, but it's uh, something to be aware of. And this depends a lot of, on the perspective. So based on this landscaping exercise, uh, and, and uh, uh, we, we did uh, think uh, about our shock take on interoperability, what it should be, what we can do. We only have limited resources. Interoperability is a, a huge field of uh, different challenges, a huge uh, area, and uh, we we had to make some decisions and, and select some things we want to do and that we will be able to do given the person months we have and given the participants in the task. So, so we decided to go the uh, a very take a very pragmatic uh, approach on this, and we uh, just uh, accept the diversity. I mean, there's uh, you could even say that you should embrace the diversity here. And we in task 3.5, we will be very much focusing on metadata formats. So that's basically. Uh, on the syntactic interoperability. So we are not going into semantics uh, or into logical interoperability. So we are just taking a look at formats that are used and uh, we are uh, uh, searching and finding conversion solutions that are useful for researchers, especially in this cross-disciplinary uh, research setting. So if uh, researcher who is well versed with social sciences wants to use language resources, for example, uh, they would find the conversion solutions they need and also some guidance on how to use them. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's uh, the conversion hub that we are now working on. Uh, there will be uh, the conversion hub will provide uh, data format, meta metadata format conversion solutions. So, so it, we will collect information about existing solutions and uh, this will be based on our inventory. Uh, uh, that was a milestone 14, not sure if it has been published yet. Uh, and uh, there are 44 solutions at the moment in our inventory and they are broadly, you can categorize them in three different categorized categories. So, so the first one is this sort of ready to use conversion services. And uh, it seems to, uh, we think that these would be the ones that benefit a researcher most at this point. Uh, but then we also have installable software. So basically something you run on your own laptop uh, to, to do conversions and then we will have receipts. So these are things that where you need to uh, do the conversion step by step, uh, doing first something and then another thing and so on. Uh, so we, we have now uh, uh, created this data model for this conversion hub. So there are a number of attributes, mostly of them are from schema.org and they are mapped to shock pro. So we are hoping this uh, will be, uh, you know, more interoperable. Uh, and then the work package three uh, is also creating the shock switchboard. Uh, so we are hoping to have these aligned and uh, working together in the future. So, so uh, a couple of words about the, solutions we have now in the conversion hub uh, and, and which we will be describing. So most of them are either from Clarin or uh, 
cross community and uh, several ones from the SESTA community. So this doesn't mean that these solutions are produced by these organizations. It's, uh, it's the target community, uh, more or less. Uh, and, and we have focused very much on uh, solutions that are openly available and freely available uh, to anybody to use uh, or, or take and read, uh, develop further. Uh, but I, I would add that there are a lot of solutions that the researchers are using uh, that have no information uh, about license, for example. Uh, so there's work to do there. It's not our task, but it's uh, just, uh, yeah, there's a lot of unclarities there. And uh, then uh, we are also have taken a look at uh, sort of the level of expertise you need to use these solutions. And since we are targeting researchers that are doing cross-disciplinary research, so uh, they will have research skills, uh, but not necessarily the skills needed to understand or uh, play with or work with uh, data that uh, is not from their own domain. Uh, it turns out that most tools uh, need to use most of these solutions, you need uh, advanced skills or even expert skills. And well, that's uh, then something that has to be there. And uh, I'm, I'm happy that, for example, SHOCK has a lot of training um, and uh, EOS will also include a lot of training because that's clearly needed in this area as well. And then we there's just a, a, the table about the invocation type. So how to get to the solution, how to invoke it. Uh, so some of some solutions have uh, user interfaces, some can be run programmatically, some are local tools. So this is something we will tidy up a little bit, but this is info, important information, for example, uh, for the switchboard. Uh, so how you can invoke the solution and uh, if it can be done sort of in the background without the researcher needing to do anything. We will also be uh, developing some new solutions. Uh, this will depend on our further analysis of the gaps and the priorities, uh, uh, what the researchers need, and also on the resources the partners uh, will have available for this work. But we are planning, for example, CMDI, DDI conversion, and that's actually something that's already ongoing. Receives around the X3ML toolkit, uh, and then some mappings, uh, conversion services uh, from DDI standards to standards within other domains like history, agriculture, uh, maybe even natural sciences. Uh, so, so these are things on our table now, and this will change uh, as the work progresses. I also uh, would like to show this uh, slide about uh, the conversion hub architecture. So it will be a Drupal 9 site. Uh, and uh, basically this is how we envision it will work. There will be an editorial team. Uh, there will be uh, the actual conversion hub uh, uh, that will have the solution descriptions, uh, user interface uh, and, and metadata about the solutions. And this will hopefully be connected to the uh, social science humanities open marketplace or the SOC marketplace and uh, well could be harvested by other catalogs. So this is basically the thinking behind this conversion hub. Uh, I will end my presentation with a slide about the uh, SOC uh, marketplace and then uh, talk a little bit about the next steps. Uh, the SOC marketplace, this slide is uh, thanks to Klaus Ilmeier, uh, who is the SOC marketplace person. And um, I'm not going to go into detail, but I, I will just say that the SOC open marketplace will collect metadata on various resources, uh, including things like conversion hub. Uh, and, and it will also relate items with each other, which is, I, I think, very important part of the marketplace. And uh, yeah, 
So there are no details yet on, on how the conversion hub will be part of the SOC marketplace. Uh, but since Klaus is also in our task and he is the person realizing the market, uh, our conversion hub uh, or the technology, so I, I'm sure that will be taken care of. So what we are going to do in, in SOC task 3.5 in the future uh, about the interoperability and conversions. Uh, so we will need to define template for these receipts I mentioned. So the step-by-step -step, uh, conversion instructions uh, and, and the, the Drupal 9 site needs to be built. Uh, then there's the, the future after shock. So we need to plan and make some suggestions on how the technical maintenance and the content maintenance will be done in the future. And, uh, and of course, I already mentioned we will be developing new solutions. So this is, uh, there's a lot of work to do, uh, uh, even, even though this is just a narrow uh, part of interoperability and a very narrow take on interoperability. Uh, but well, we have to start somewhere and uh, this is a very practical thing to start with. Uh, at least that's our thinking. And this will also enable researchers to use uh, cross-disciplinary uh, resources better. And uh, we hope that also it will uh, encourage uh, documenting data, for example, using the metadata standards, uh, at least community-specific metadata standards. And that way it will help also all aspects of FAIR of, of metadata in the longer run uh, and data. That is basically all uh, I had to say. So if you have any questions, uh, happy to take them now, or we can also go on with Claudia's presentation and take questions. Yeah, I would suggest to make the next um, presentation and then have a discussion round, right? At the yes. end. But our 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 attendees are very quiet. There's nothing in the chat. <laughs> no question up to now. Okay, let me share my screen. And Claudia, please, if you can introduce yourself. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm Claudia from the German Climate Computing Center, um, working for B2Find for quite a long time. B2Find is a central service of EOS Cup. Um, it's been developed a long time ago within the EUDAT infrastructure, EUDAT CDI it is now, um, which means we have some years experience in, <laughs> as Marie said, uh, start somewhere. <laughs> to enable anyhow interdisciplinary discovery. And that's what I would like to talk about. Mm, it may sound a bit like a marketing action for B2Find, but that's not intended. It's just one, the way we do it, we um, come to a lot of issues that I believe other catalogs and tools and other services um, have too. So maybe it, it's it, the intention is more to we describe what we do and we, describe what we think is um, crucial for enhanced discoverability um, and hope that people, um, oh, other people have solutions for us. <laughs> That's actually the intention. I just learned that it is not uh, called discovery anymore, but findability. So well then, since interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary findability and practice. Can you share my, uh, can you see my slides? Yes, Hello? yes, we yes. can see. It. Super. Be to find how it works is that we are harvesting communities. We do some mapping with the metadata we get. That's our metadata ingestion. And we upload those metadata then um, due to our own schema into our work, work portal. And there people can search for data. That's the idea. For harvesting, we use still OAI PMH. This is, for instance, one discussion point. How should we rely on OAI PMH or just develop even better transfer options and protocols? And 
Um, hmm. I mean, OAI PMH is old, um, but it's stable, it works, and it has some options that are nice to have, for instance, um, creating subsets and defining different metadata prefixes and so on and so on, and even define um, for incremental harvesting a, that you only upload or expose changed records and so on and so on. So old but stable. Di direct JSON RPs, of course, I believe will, will be the come even more in the future. We do support catalog service for the web and we do not really support linked data. So Sparkle queries, yes. In theory we do, but not in practice, it's not really working. The mapping is, let's say on three levels, it's on the technical one is that we convert the formats from one to another, no, no, no. Um, the semantic mapping is the interesting part because there something is done and we can decide what is done. Um, and the specific mapping is important because we do map metadata as much as possible according to what communities need. And communities, in our point, are always the data provider we are harvesting from. And we can do this now very specific. And in a way, you could argue that this is a way of um, even metadata creation. The search itself, it's a free text search, faceted search. You can narrow down the results. And uh, this is as it is now, those communities are integrated in Beetle Find. I mean, that's quite a lot. And um, that's only, which is in now, and we have even 20 more to come. As you see, this is really diverse. EVOA is um, astronomical data, CNO is marine data, um, a lot of natural sciences coming from in Geo, Fun, Pangea, of course, some from the European spallation sources from the um, high energy physics. For the mapping, we have, we call them reader. So this is the way to automatically ingest metadata, which use standards like DataSide, Dublin Core. ISO is the uh, standard for georeference data. It is very, very important in the old, especially earth and environmental communities because uh, they are forced to use it, whether that's useful or not. Hmm. FGDC is kind of adapted ESO for Dublin Core, um, so a kind of ESO light. FF is a specific um, metadata standard for Danish archaeologists. I don't know whether someone else is using it. We have had DDI and CMDI in the old b to find version. We do not have it now because uh, we just updated and haven't haven't done it now, but will we ever come to that later? And as I said, this community specific thing means in a way we do curate data. That's our search portal. So that's the web interface. This is just a screenshot. I won't show you that because that will take too long, but just have a look. It's b2findeu.eu. What's new? Well, quite a lot, actually everything. We have really new machines. Um, we have a new software stack and this software stack is uh, composed of, well, let's say three components. It's the one is the ingestion code, the other one is the CCAN interface, and it's the metadata exposure. All of this is really new now. Everything is in GitHub, all source is, uh, all code is uh, open, openly accessible and even reusable if someone wants to do that. And we have a new schema, we have a new b 2 find metadata schema, <laughs> um, which is already implemented as an existing and which is described and published in our guidelines. Um, the, the, the slides are uploaded already, I think. Um, so you have all links here for those who are interested. What does it mean it is new? What is new? What can we do now? We can know um, the ingestion code refers to the whole harvesting and mapping part. And what is new is that we can do harvest from different harvesting points, but include all the records within one community in B2Find. And we can even do specific mapping for each endpoint within one community. So if you have a community using different endpoints with different standards, like Clarine is doing for their own repositories, but they also have, for instance, um, 
meet records in B2Share, which is a repository software and which is using another standard. Um, and we can do integrate them both with different harvesting endpoints, different map files within one community. The next part is, so to say, the part of mapping and uploading. Oh, that refers, so we have uh, new facets, even more facets now, and we have a lot of new options for the whole interaction with uh, CCAN, but I won't describe them all, it's boring. Um, well, not boring for us, but boring for others to listen because you don't see it. <laughs> um, finally, we do expose our metadata now. So B2Find is only since a week, um, no, only four weeks. So last week we opened up our extension. Um, we do expose our metadata now. Which is funny because in earlier times we um, could always say, aha, the way you do offer your metadata is bad, do it in a better way. And now we are in a position that we also expose our metadata. And now others are coming saying, hey, the way you do expose your metadata is not good, make it better. Yeah. The idea behind is that open air uh, is going to harvest B2Find. To it's not working on the productive B2Find to find yet, but it's working already on the test machines and we will. Um, make B2 find harvestable within this year, so within the next two weeks. Now, our new schema looks like that. These are the metadata elements. And of course, you can ask, why the hell do we have the now the metadata schema? And the answer is, as always, because we need it. We need it. We need. Um, our discipline, for instance, because B2Find was developed to make resources from very, very, very different um, research domains searchable within one portal. And this is very tricky for a lot of things. Like we have this temporary coverage. Um, now, try to think of paleontologists who would like to have a record for the Paleocene a few million years um, before Christ. Uh, and then you want to have some, some high energy physics who are searching for, let's say, a nanosecond um, within last year. And you have to find a way to, to, to display that. We chose to use seconds since Christian birth. So all dates are transferred to Chris, a second since Christian birth. It's not really usable, I have to agree. Um, but that's the idea, but that's why we need temporary coverage. So it, it, it's, the, it's the, um, the time frame the data is about. Um, and then you come to a lot of problems. Like I said, how do you tackle so different date formats and so different really granularity levels of millions of years up to some nanoseconds? We have integrated instrument now. Instrument comes out of practice because within the earth and environmental community and also for the high energy physics, the, um, they do have instruments and instruments seems to be a very specific element, which is important for, um, for displaying information. Actually, you could sum up. So B2Find is more or less data site with some additional elements and the additional elements are the community. The community I already said are the, for us, are the data provider or research infrastructure or data archive or however you want to call it or however they want to call themselves. We have the metadata access as, an, as a special element which um, that refers to the original metadata, which is useful, I think, because maybe when you have a record in ESO um, displaying a lot of parameters and a lot of um, values within the parameters we cannot display, but maybe if someone found uh, found this interesting, it, it could be useful. So I wouldn't put that away. We have instrument, I already said, and temporary coverage as our own thing. Hmm. Um, now, about standards and interoperability, about generic metadata standards. To sum up what I just said is that we have a, if you compare b 2 find data set and open air, we have the additional elements in this community. In details, uh, for data site, you could argue um, it's the prefix data site is offering, 
but then you should know which community facility institution or whatever has which prefix. Um, the identifier in B2Find is, can be any one. We need one valid identifier. We prefer to have the UIs. We can display PIDs and everything that is not a PID or a DOI is a called source. It's just, it could be any URL or URL or whatever you want to do. Mavi already said the main point with data site is um, actually it was made for data sites. It was made, it was created in order to get a DOI. <laughs> Well, which means the identifier type is DOI. Um, of course, we could misuse, so to say, data sites. Um, we do this for our own metadata because we do have records in B2Find which have no DOI. So we just put them into alternate identifier. And again, as Mavi said, uh, open air is. Uh, that's the open air way. That, so B2Find is following the open air way <laughs> and agreeing that data site is not usable in that way, but I'm convinced this will change. We have discipline. I already said that this element is very important for us and data sites and open air stick to the subject. Um, we have instrument now, we have contact, which is in data site and open air, only a contributor type contact person. The reason being for contact is that when you have, um, very often you have specific databases where you just can't download any data because the amount of data is too big and it's a special format. This is certainly true for the climate modeling um, community, so to say. So if you wanna, if you wanna download a 90 gig, file with in the format that does that, that does crash with a windows thing so a contact is more for if there when there is a generic or not a, gen, a general contact for one database it just makes sense to have this as the central entry point or contract point for people who are interested in those records temporary coverage is in data sites and open air so to say only date which makes it tricky because they have very, very um, um, specified values for this date type, but it's not so easy for us to reuse that. So we decided to stay with temporal coverage and spatial coverage I already said is for us the, the map when it is displayed. Now, what I want to say with the whole stuff, um, actually that the question about the equilibrium between the community specific metadata that are within metadata elements um, and those that refer to a generic schema like data site open air or even need to find um, is tricky. And I believe this is, well, it's a process. I mean, the question is about 25 years old, maybe even longer. So how many new elements do you need? And this is an ongoing process. And it's a kind of, um, it's dealing, right? It's developing, it doesn't stop and there will never be one solution for all. So it will continue to be kind of developing thing. Coming to one example, <laughs> DAPA has so many endpoints. This is a screenshot, not a screenshot, but um, take, talking from our harvesting um, program. What you see here is that all these things here refer to different endpoints. And actually all those sets, these are OAI sets. Um, so RKI is Robert Koch Institute, ZBW is Zentralbibliothek für Wirtschaftswissenschaft, some of the others I don't know. Um, and you see Jesus failed at that time when we did it. <laughs> Um, when you have so many different endpoints, what we can do with the new code, with our new software stack and with the new b 2 find, we are able to define for all those um, endpoints specific mapping issues. I want to show, I would like to show you this in practice, just a second. Thank you. 
You should um, see a GitHub repo, do you? Yes. Super. You have a class, Dara, a base class um, that has a name and that has an endpoint and that has an even a, a schema. And then you have kind of a definition for the whole of the base Dara community, which is social sciences if you don't find any other um, discipline within the subjects, within the keywords. And this we've done for all belonging subsets. So there are some have education science as a default when there is no possibility to map it automatically from the keywords. This is the usual case. Um, we could add for each endpoint, we could add even more specific elements like additional keywords or wh whatever. So the way to make it flexible is really to make the ingestion and the mapping and the upload at the end flexible is really it's nice. Honestly, is what we should have been had for I think at least two years, but now really we are we are doing it, and now really it works. It looks like here when you that's the productive feature find right now. Uh, if you go to community and then take Dara and then have a look for what the disciplines are and you're interested in, don't know, say something. Education science. Yeah, but maybe you want only the records. Ah, in German, of course. <laughs> and then you click somewhere. Oh, that's a long. And there you have the elements, which links to the resource itself. Yeah, and as I'm here now, I will show you. This is the schema. Uh, implemented at XSD, and this is the GitHub repos. So the one for the Tikan GUI, that's the um, B to find ingestion code, and this is the one for exposing our themes. And then I would like to refer. I um, I wrote down all links in the slides, so you can do it later on. On here we have guidelines for everything. Um, And here we have a very, very ex um, extensive description of the schema of our own B2 find schema and of the concordance with other standards. So DDI is already written in because DDI is on our list. And now I'm going to go back to the presentation when it works. Because um, uh, as part of um, uh, the work package three in Fair is Fair and work package three, I forgot the title of the work, but it's something with practice. Uh, I saw that Kat was in the chat, um, not, not in the chat, but in attendees. So Kat, please correct me if I say something wrong. Um, the idea is to develop something um, that may enhance interdisciplinary discovery. And the question now is what this something is. Um, the <laughs> behind the whole deliverable was the idea that um, there should there is an analysis of the metadata catalogs concept in different domain specific research infrastructures. And they had a pilot proposal to um, improve the integration in a cross-disciplinary way. And they, what is special is that all EOS clusters are part of this um, project, um, which is funny because for instance, PANOSC and uh, Envry Fair, some communities of Envry Fair, uh, and a big part of ESCAPE, the IVOA part, are already integrated in B2Find. So now the idea is to have DCAT version two and the DDI CDI, which is a kind of um, enhanced DDI as far as I understood, 
um, should be used by those clusters and then um, integrated in B2 find. And the idea is that at the end, we have an enhanced discoverability or findability of research data. We, I, we don't know how, whether that will happen, but at least the idea is super. Um, for us, it's splendid because at the end, what will come out is that we have again a DDI CDI reader and a DCAT reader, um, and we can test how good or bad B2 find schema is. I'm perfectly in time. We have, and this is the last slide, and we have 10 more minutes for discussion. Um, for B2 find itself, the future projects, which I believe are important for the whole findability stuff is Clara Science, which, which is a classification for research areas. And uh, I think the first idea was two years ago um, when we met people from re 3 data who noticed that we have the same issue that we have not, not, uh, not a sufficient classification which we could reuse. So we decided to make it new. It's ongoing work. I mean, now it's Corona and the whole world is getting mad. So take some time, but this will come. And uh, certainly within the DICE proposal, there will a, be a cooperation with data set um, within one work package explicitly for PIDs for instruments. So I believe that these metadata element instruments of course will come in other standards as well. Is it, is it already one in DDI? I don't know. Discussion points, these are just ideas. I think we could discuss, uh, or we will see, I mean, lots of things, but what is from my point of view still the, the question, do, you, do we go to linked data or not? So as I said, in principle, we could integrate uh, Sparkle queries, but in practice we cannot, but even then, um, do you go for linked data or do you go still for anyhow relational databases? And, and Marie again said some in, in her slides that the point is well, make it practical and at the end make all. And I would totally agree to that. Um, anyhow, try, we should anyhow try to combine as much as possible in an automated way to include all different um, ways. We, very important is granularity. Um, it, 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 as Marie said, there is no middle ground exactly. So it's either top level or very specific level, but nothing in between. Um, and finally, this is how I would call, when is a persistent identifier really persistent? Well, um, well. <laughs> I will stop here um, and open up the discussion and questions. If someone wants. Thank you, Claudia. I, I think there's some discussion ongoing in the chat. Uh, uh, for example, about citation now, uh, most recently, and uh, the, the, and what to cite, uh, on, on what level to cite. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you, Claudia, is, is you said something about finding the balance between communities uh, uh, community specific and generic. So, so do you think you have now found the right balance or, or is, it, is that something that's, uh, yes. that's uh, ongoing? That's ongoing. The problem is that we, we have, for instance, for, as I said, the earth environmental thing. So you have, um, you need georeference data, but actually you want to know georeference, what does it mean? So if you have a sensor somewhere in the ocean, but you don't need only to measure the, the surface, but only a certain depth. Or if you want to measure uh, a Kohlenstoff, what it is in English, um, CO2, carbon dioxide. <laughs> if you want to measure carbon dioxide somewhere in the air, in the atmosphere, in certain different levels of atmosphere, you need a vertical layer and we don't have a vertical layer. Everything we can express in, as far as I know, in, in, in the whole generic area is only two dimensional places on earth, which is not sufficient. And this is valid for everything. We, there are so many parameters, um, I believe in the social sciences as well, where you have key value pairs, like this is our, it, it's a survey and it contains that and specific elements, but how do you wanna 
um, integrate them all. I don't have a clue. So I mean, the perfect idea would be linked data. You just link everything and then you have a three-dimensional portal in, in your web where you can just click from every concept to every concept. But this is not reality and will not come within the next five years. So, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree the the linking link links between things objects uh, data whatever they are that's a difficult part of it but uh, that would be very useful for for the end users for the researchers uh, are there any questions from the audience you can unmute yourself and and ask a question Overwhelmed, everybody. Mm. Well, I, then uh, I, I just want to bring up something from the, the comments as well. So uh, Richard ha Dennis has commented that, uh, I mean, if, if there's something that doesn't meet all of our needs, then we as a community uh, can work to improve. And I, I think I strongly agree with that. We should uh, combine and join forces whenever possible. Uh, and I, I think uh, EOSC is, is one thing where we can do that. I, I just don't know exactly how, uh, but I think uh, conferences uh, and sessions like this are a good start. Hi, Mari. This is uh, Dan. Hello, Dan. Hi. Welcome. Uh, hi, Claudia. Uh, hi. I've got a question for you, Claudia. Uh, oh. About, <laughs> yeah, yeah. About, uh, how do you say, um, scalability of it all. Uh, you showed an enormous number of, uh, say, endpoints that you harvest. Uh, what, what, can you, what can you manage? And, and what, what's it, what do you think it's in the end worth? Uh, um, because you lose lots of information also, right? Mapping everything to your core um, yeah. metadata facets. So what's, what's your, your strong opinion here? Uh, well, first, there, th these are two different things. So for the technical circumstances, um, the only limitation we have is CKAN. So CKAN as the, as the web interface we use, and we use it only more or less as a GUI, nothing else, right? Um, this could limit us, but we think only with new machine, it will be coming complicated for about 10 million records, and we have now 1 million. So hmm. <laughs> we have at least next year it will work. And I mean, then in two years, the next EOS project's coming, maybe then we have a well. So for the next two years, it's safe. Um, for in principle, the code itself. So what we did in development is that um, we can scale up to, I don't know, everything, not, not everything, but we can scale up uh, without any problems. Um, when we just use, we could use another database or our own database and just our own web interface. So technically, technically we are safe. It's only CKAN limiting us. The other question you said was, we are losing information when we map everything to our schema. True, exactly, true. Um, but how else to do it? <laughs> what I would like to have is a kind of templates within B2Find, so you have a template for um, social sciences or medicine or for medicine it's a body maybe and for astrophysics it's space <laughs> for the earth it's 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 a map um, well, but even then meant... we would need even then sorry, we would need what... more oh shit. sorry yeah but what I meant with scalability is not so much the technical technological limits but rather what can you manage with respect to the mappings because every time you mm. uh, uh, have a new um, endpoint you have to uh, create your mappings and uh, sometimes th th these are not so easy to to create so what 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 can you what how, how much does it cost how many persons do you do you need to to uh, maintain these uh, these mappings and, uh, this is a stupid question i mean in reality right? the point is claudio claudia you get so and so many pms do yeah yeah yeah, yeah but possible, so that's what I, that's exactly what I meant. So, how much does it cost now? A full Claudia or half Claudia? I know. Uh, about currently, I think for the next two years we have two Claudias. It's Claudia and Annalena. <laughs> I, I think. Yeah, but yeah. So, of. so I think our time is up. Uh, we just, uh, if there's a very quick question or comment, we can take that, and otherwise we need to free the space, so to speak. Yeah, maybe just an add-on for Dan. 
I think you need per big community one person. So you have to, to bring the mapping more and more to the commun the data provider. So it's not possible for the for this data curation uh, level, what which uh, B2 finds, provided it's not possible that you do it. Otherwise, you need hundreds of developers. So my yeah, provocative answer. <laughs> I mean, that's a good statement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I think we need to end. I, I think we also need to continue the discussion uh, on the resources, scalability, and all the other interoperability aspects and uh, the use cases and so on. So, but I, I thank you, Claudia, for your presentation, and thank you everybody okay. for joining the session and, and uh, in the conversation. And uh, yeah, let's uh, see. Hopefully, see each other in other sessions. So have a nice day and a nice conference. So thank you very thank much you. and uh, goodbye. <laughs>